to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the greatest question ever asked comes in Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We welcome you today to our study on the subject of salvation. In particular, we're going to be talking about God's plan of salvation and the answer to that question, what must I do to be saved? You know, as you think about Acts chapter 16, you can imagine the scene. In the prison in Philippi, those walls, they began to shake. The prison doors flew open. At that moment, a jailer, a prison guard, he awoke. He realized his own fate and he started to commit suicide. He started to kill himself. But before he did, he heard these encouraging words. Sir, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And upon the heels of that encouraging statement, that greatest question that's ever been asked comes, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Today we're going to think about that question. And as near as I can tell, that question is only asked two other times in the Bible. Acts 2 verse 37, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then in Acts 9 verse 6, Paul said, or Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And so what is God's plan of salvation? What does the Bible say a person must do to be saved? You know, to really help us, understand this question better and and the importance of it we might could ask the question by placing emphasis on the different words inside the question let me illustrate for example we could say what must I do to be saved this teaches us that salvation is active you can't just sit back and somehow expect you're going to magically be saved there's something man must do and jesus said that matthew 7 21 it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says lord lord that's going there listen now but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. But then we might ask the question this way, what must I do to be saved? This teaches us that salvation is imperative. We're not talking about flippant, nonchalant, lackadaisical matter that you can just take it if you want it or leave it if you want it. This is an imperative. You must be saved. You cannot get to heaven. You cannot live with God. You cannot be forgiven of your sins, of all the essential things. This is imperative. You must be saved. But then we might ask it like this as well. What must I do to be saved? Salvation is personal. Friend, in all kindness, we're not asking what did your mama do? What did your daddy do? Or what did your grandpa do? Or what did some person close to you do? The question is, what must I do to be saved? Salvation is personal for this reason. Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. When I stand before God, I'm going to give an account of my life. I'm going to give an account of the things I've done or the things I haven't done. I'm going to be saved or lost based on whether I've followed God and His teaching or not. And so what must I, the personal nature of it, is so important. But then we might also say, what must I do to be saved? Not get or not feel, but, but do. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, Keep my commands. You're my friends if you do whatever I ask you. John 15, verse number 14. And again, implying that man has to do something to be right with God. But then the most important part of the question of all. What must I do to be saved? 
This is a question of eternal importance. If I answer this question according to the will of God and obey the gospel, the Bible says the righteous will go away into eternal life. I can live in heaven with God for all eternity. But if I don't follow God and I don't answer it according to the teaching of Christ and the Bible, friend, there is a place called hell. And Jesus said, it is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter 9, verse number 44. God wants you to be saved. We want you to be saved. And, and that's the motivation behind our lesson today. And so before we look at this question and the answer to it, we want each of us to stop for just a moment. And we want you to consider two very important things. Number one, we want you to know more than anything in all the world, that the God of heaven loves you deeply. God wants all men to be saved. First Timothy 2, 4, and God loved you so much, He sent His own Son to die for you. John 3, verse 16, and we love your eternal soul. The reason we're speaking on the subject of salvation, I will promise you today, the motivation of that is out of a love for eternal souls. Now, there's a second thing, though, that we want you to do. As we begin to think about this lesson, and as you begin to think about it in your own mind, we want you to stop for just a moment and think about your own salvation experience. I want you to think about when you were saved. Do you remember where you were at? Maybe you're at camp. Maybe you were in a church building somewhere. Maybe you were at home, wherever it may be. I just want you to think about where, where were you when you were saved? Do you remember how old you are? Maybe you don't because maybe you, somebody told you you were saved as a baby. Maybe you were 10, maybe you are 12, maybe it was later in life. Whatever the age, I just want to think about where you were, how old you were. And then I want you to think about, what did I do by which I knew I was saved? Maybe somebody told you to come down front and make an altar call. Maybe somebody told you to say the sinner's prayer. Maybe you did other things. All I'm asking you right now is to draw up in your own mind, to remember in your own mind your salvation experience. And then as we think about God's plan of salvation today, we just ask you to compare the two. If what you've done matches what God says you must do, then friend, that's wonderful. That, that's the greatest thing ever. But if they don't, then we encourage you today to make those changes where they're necessary. And so in our lesson today, and in the lesson that will precede this, that will follow this as well, we're going to be asking and answering two very important questions. What must I know to be saved and what must I do to be saved? Now friend, I understand and I realize there are things the Bible teaches, there are things that I must know to be saved. How do I know that? Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Must I know God's truth to be free? Absolutely. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 17, Do not be ignorant, but understand the will of the Lord. And so let us mention today three things specifically that one must know if he's going to be saved. What must I know to be saved? Number one, I must know that I, outside of Christ, I am lost in sin and headed down the road to destruction. Friend, that's not pleasant for anybody. It's not something we like to think about. But you know what? If I'm going to be saved, I've got to come to terms with the fact that outside of Christ, I'm lost in sin and I'm headed down the wrong path to destruction. Now, how do we know that's the case? The Bible says in Romans 3 verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. There, nobody is perfect. Romans 3 verse 23, of uh, people who have an accountable age in mind, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None righteous, all have sinned. Now, what's the consequence of sin? The wages of sin is death. The Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not short that He cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. When I sin and when you sin, when we're in sin, we're lost. We're in a state of spiritual death and we are separated. Separated 
from the God of all love and the God of salvation. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Men and women who remain in sin and die that way, what a horrible, horrible thing that will be. And friend, I understand. Nobody likes to talk about sin. We realize, you know, we don't like to think about it. But until I can really realize, hey, I can't do this on my own. I can't save myself. Uh, there's no way I, I cannot figure my own path to heaven until I come to terms with the fact that I'm lost and I need God. Salvation is not going to be something I'm concerned about. Do we really understand how lost we are without God? Secondly, for a person to be saved, not only must he realize he's in sin, but that person must realize he cannot save himself. No matter how hard I try, no matter how many good things I may do, I'll never earn or merit my own salvation. This is the way Jeremiah said it in the long ago. The Bible says in Jeremiah 10 verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not himself, is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own paths. I, I can't save myself. John 6 verse 68, Jesus had made some hard statements at that point in time. Some decided to walk with Jesus no more. Jesus turned to the rest and said, Do you want to go away also? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I need to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. Yes, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14, verse number 12. This is why from Scripture, we realize that salvation is in Christ. If I'm going to be saved, I cannot do it myself. I cannot make my own way of salvation. Nobody can tell me of themselves and through their own path how to get there. I've got to follow God's plan to be saved. But then thirdly, once I realize I'm lost in sin, and once I realize I cannot save myself, friend, I've got to come to terms with the fact that if I'm going to be saved, It'll be God who saves me. You see, the Bible teaches that we're saved by the grace of God. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm saved by God's grace, God's wonderful favor, unmerited favor toward me. The grace of God that brings salvation, the Bible says, has appeared to all men. It's here, and it's available for everybody. Titus 2, verses 11 through 12. And friend, it's found in Jesus Christ, John 1 verse 17. The Bible says I'm saved by the good news or the gospel of God or of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 16. We are to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls, James 1 21 and 22. And Paul said to Christians in Rome, God be thanked, though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Friend, I'm saved by obedience to the will of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. Jesus said, it's not everybody who just goes out and says, Lord, that's going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 7, verse 21. And friend, I'm saved through and in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts 2 verse 47 that when men and women obeyed God's plan of salvation, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. I'm saved in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that He purchased with His own blood. And so we ask you today to consider these things. Do you, do you realize that without Christ, you're lost in sin, that you are headed down the path to destruction, that you cannot, no matter what, save yourself, and that only by the gospel and obedience to God's plan of salvation you can be saved. Friend, if you realize those things, then the next logical question is, what must I do to be saved? John chapter 7, verse 17, if anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. What, what does the doctrine of Christ teach? I've got to know to do the will of God. Like the Philippian jailer, Acts 16 verse 30, what must I do to be saved? 
Friend, as we think about this idea, we want to we mention God's steps in the plan of salvation that man must do to be pleasing to the Father. The first step is we've got to hear or listen to the Word of God. Uh, I want to direct your attention to a passage in the Bible in Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, that passage teaches us that if we want to have faith, we've got to hear the Word of God. Now, how do I know then that hearing is essential? Well, because faith is essential. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Must I have faith to please God? Yes. How do you get faith? Whatever f way I get faith is essential. Wouldn't you agree? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Psalm 95 verse 7, In the long ago David said today, If you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. To be saved, to get faith, I must hear the Word of God. My friend, I want to ask you to think with me today about this. What does it mean, according to the Scriptures, to hear the Word of God? Does it mean that whatever anybody says, I've got to hear and accept that as gospel truth? Does it mean that I've got to listen to everybody? Well, what does it mean, really, to... How does the Bible define hearing God's Word? My friend, to hear God's Word means these things from Scripture. Number one, hearing the Word of God means I recognize the absolute and final authority of the Bible. Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and Mark chapter 9 and Matthew 17 up on that high mountain and the Bible says He is there transfigured before them. His, he begins to shine. His clothes are so ultra white that they're, and they're so amazed as uh, Moses and Elijah are there discussing with Jesus and, and Peter because he's afraid and really doesn't know what to say blurts out, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. One account tells us, before he even finished getting those words out of his mouth, this voice came down from heaven. Listen to what it said. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Friend, if I'm going to be saved, hearing correctly means that I recognize the authority of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that I recognize the authority of the New Testament. Jesus said it this way. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority, not some, not a little, not most, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. If Jesus has all authority, how much does that leave for everybody else? Well, you can't have more than all. He's the final authority, and the New Testament his New Testament is our final authority today. Whatever I do in word or deed, I'm to do all in the name of or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 17. And friend, this is why we want to illustrate this as being so important in salvation. When I stand before God on that great judgment day, what standard am I going to be judged by? Jesus said in John 12, 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Friend, I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. His words are the final authority. God said, listen to him. Therefore, to hear the word of God correctly, I first must recognize the absolute authority of Jesus Christ and His New Testament. Secondly, to hear the Word of God correctly, I must search, I must seek, and I must prove that what I'm being told or what I'm trying to be taught is according to the Word of God. How do we know that's the case? I want, to, I want you to think with me about a, probably the perfect exa example in the Bible of hearing. Acts 17 verse 11 these are the Bereans, and they're more noble than those in Thessalonica. And it says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, Acts 17, 11, in that they received the word with all readiness, readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, 
you think with me in your mind about what happens, okay? Paul comes to the region of Berea. He approaches the door of somebody he's going to talk to about the gospel. He knocks on that door and he says, I'm Paul. I'd like to tell you about Jesus. I want to relate the message of the gospel and salvation to you. What did they do at that point? Did they slam the door in his face? No. They received it with all readiness of mind. What's that mean? They said, Paul, we've heard about you and we've heard about the gospel and we'd like to hear more. Come in and sit down. Paul sat down. They sat down. He began to tell about Jesus, to tell about the gospel, to open up the scriptures from the Old Testament. What they do next in hearing? Did they say, Paul, you know, we're just going to take your word at it and that's right. We believe you because you're Paul. No. They said, Paul, we've heard what you had to say. We appreciate you coming today. We've written these things down and we've taken notes. Now we're going to check it. What do you mean we're going to check it? They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They took what Paul said. They listened intently, but it wasn't the final word until they checked it in the scriptures. Friend, if I, and listen so carefully, this is where so many people are duped when it comes to religion. So many people are told something. It sounds good, or it's popular, or it's what people want to hear, so they just accept it hook, line, and sinker without checking it. I have a personal responsibility with anything I hear to check it by the Scriptures. And so do you. The Bible says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. The Bible says, test the spirits to see if they are of God. Why? Many false prophets have gone out. How do you know somebody's not telling you a lie? 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4. Study to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. And so, number one, when I hear something, I recognize that Jesus and the New Testament are the final authority. When I hear something, I'm going to let that be the standard by which I double-check everything. And then thirdly, as it relates to hearing, friend, I want to listen with an ear toward eternity. Luke 8, 18, Jesus said, Take heed how you hear. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, take heed what you hear. How are you listening? Who are you listening to? Mark 9, verse 7, hear ye him. And then do you remember that little statement? In every one of the seven letters, or the letters to the seven congregations in Asia Minor, here's what Jesus said. To him that has ears to hear, let him hear. What's Jesus saying when he mentions that? When Jesus says to those Christians in Asia Minor, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear, what's he saying? How many people you know that don't have ears? What God give you your ears for? Do you have ears? And what are they to be used for? You've got ears. Jesus is saying, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear. God gave you ears for a reason. Listen to my voice. Obey that. Listen with an ear toward eternity and with a heart that is directed toward pleasing God. And so what must I do to be saved? Friend, to be saved, you absolutely must hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so again, as we started at the outset of this lesson, we want you to think about this great question, what must I do to be saved? We want you to think about your own salvation. We want you to think about what the Bible, what you've done and then what the Bible says. Do you realize that without Christ you're lost in sin? Do you realize that you cannot save yourself? And do you realize that you must be obedient to the gospel to be right with God? If so, then have you heard the Word of God? Do you believe? The Bible teaches you must believe. Do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Do you really believe? Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. Would you, once you have believed, be willing to repent of sin? Jesus said in Luke 13, 5, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would I turn from sin? It may be a life in sin or things in my life that are sinful and not right. Would I turn from that and turn to God? Acts 3 verse 19. Would you be willing to confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 10, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made 
unto salvation. And would you, to be saved and to have that sin which separates you from God completely removed, would you be baptized? Jesus said, I mean, listen to the simplicity of it. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did Jesus say you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? You bet He did. That's the exact wording of Mark 16, verse 16. If I don't even believe, I'm not even a candidate to be baptized. But if I believe and I'm baptized, I will be saved. Think about the words of Peter in Acts 2, verse 38. Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Do you want your sins removed? Do you want that barrier that is separating you from God taken out of the way? Baptism is for the removal or remission of sins. John 3, verse 5, Jesus said it this way, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do you want to live with God forever? Do, do you want to be a part of God's kingdom? You've got to be born of water and the Spirit. And then once one obeys the gospel, that person must be faithful unto death. Romans 6, verse 4 describes the conversion process. We die to sin, we're buried with Christ in baptism, we're raised up out of the waters of light, waters of, uh, raised up out of the water, just as Jesus was raised up out of the grave to walk in newness of life. We've got to strive every day to be faithful unto death. And so, friend, we ask you today, out of love and concern for lost souls, have you really answered the question, what must I do to be saved according to the Bible? Have you done the things that we've talked about today? If not, they're not hard to do. We'd be happy to help you with any of those things. You can contact us through our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can call us or contact us with the information given. And friend, we just want you to know this, that the God of heaven loves you deeply and wants you to be saved, and so do we. And we pray that you may obey the gospel and be saved. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.